this is kind of a new way of thinking about theater, which is to break down the barrier between the community and this thing that you love doing. People would walk in, they'd never been to a theater like this. They're, they're used to going to a theater where there are 20 rows back, and where they're in there with 1,500, 3,000 people. And they walk into this theater where there's 150 people and the acting is right there and it is a completely different experience. It's very uh, easy in a theater in a big city to sort of stumble into the actual auditorium and then you stumble back out into the street almost as quickly as you came in. In a building like this, there's space for conversation and space for engagement and space to digest the art that you've just seen. The artistic aesthetic and the architecture have been so put together to create an epic, immersive experience for our audience. We want to be a space where every single human being, no matter who they are, what they look like, where they come from, feels like it's their space. And that's what theater should do. But the fact that you walk into that space and you don't understand its complexity, you just enjoy the details. It's kind of an engineering miracle. With over 55,000 theater goers a year, Theater Squared has become a cultural landmark best known for its first class productions done completely in house. Its recent work landed them on the New York Times Best Theater of 2020 list, and their newly completed building won the 2020 American Architecture Award. Theater Squared is about more than a company, a production, or even a building. It's about the people that attend and the community that they serve. But what I wanted to know is how does a world class theater end up in Northwest Arkansas? Let's find out. Hey, can you let me in? I want to learn about your building. I think one of the amazing things about live theater is that it comes in all shapes and sizes and can live almost anywhere. The initial reaction is, where is Arkansas? What are you guys doing out there? I was like this. I'm from New York. Uh, first time I came to Arkansas. You come out here, it's Arkansas. You know, yeah, whatever. But then fall in love instantly with Fayetteville. When I heard Northwest Arkansas, I thought of Walmart and Razorback football. When I got here, I was met with rolling hills, fall colors, and quaint town squares with a thriving arts district. In a place like Northwest Arkansas that's growing so rapidly and is sort of engaging, I think, really actively in the process of creative placemaking. The audiences in Northwest Arkansas are open to adventure and are willing to be a little risky, and that's really exciting. If you're born in Arkansas and you get married in Arkansas, but then you move to Texas and you get a divorce, are you still brother and sister? <laughs> Sweet Jesus. That risky approach to their productions attracts not only local talent, but actors and playwrights from coast to coast. When they show up to their first performance, the reaction is always the same their faces would just light up, or they would just, oh my God. They're just, they're blown away. Actors love it. One of the reasons actors love performing at Theater Squared is the ability to feel up close and personal to the audience. The ultra wide orientation of the stage and seating configuration allow for a greater intimacy between the actor and the audience. The connection with that whole house is so 
they're so close. There's such a connection there and you can really feel it. From the beginning, Theatre Squared has been very much about connection between people, between the audience and the people on stage. But the best acting, you know, is truthful moments happening all in service to a story that lives in the hearts and minds of the audience. Standing on that stage, under the lights, and in front of an audience is enough to elevate anyone's performance. Now presenting Design versus Build. That looked really nice. Well, that performance was seriously lacking. Time to find true inspiration by hearing from the architects. Theater Squared is the most important project that we've worked on as a cultural institution. Marvel Designs is an interdisciplinary design firm with offices in New York City and Puerto Rico. At the time, they had recently completed their first theater project, Brooklyn St. Anne's Warehouse, in collaboration with world-renowned theater design firm Charcoal Blue. Marvel Design founding partner, Lissa So, played a major part in the project's research and design. My roots are from a town that's very much like Fayetteville, you know, university town. I was really intrigued by that idea that, you know, theater that like, is coming out of New York City could be in this place like Fayetteville. And they were doing it in this, you know, old warehouse building. The space itself had been sort of lovingly converted from a beer distribution warehouse, so we like to joke that it's been bringing people joy for decades. The unique configuration of the Walton Art Center was something that the community grew to love, and for 14 years they would pack the space out. When I would talk about building this building, rather than people getting excited, they would get a little bit concerned. And they'd be like, what, you, uh, what, what are, you get, are you getting bigger? Because you're not gonna lose that intimacy, right? Like everyone, that was the word that, that came out. The other thing that was really important to them was that the building, the Performing Arts Center itself felt like it was for the community, a place that really welcomed you in at all times of the day. Um, so it, it was really developing this balance of providing these phenomenal theaters, but also having a place that had the scale of gathering many, many people, but at the same time felt very comfortable if you were just one or two people sitting and, and having a cup of coffee. Part of the reason to make theater is to understand what makes us human. So how can you make a building human? Making a building human certainly doesn't happen overnight. The design process happens over, you know, typically about a year to, you know, with Theater Squared it was about I, th I think it was about 15 months that we were really designing and documenting the project. We kept showing up at meetings thinking they would have a drawing of a building and it never happened. Or at least it didn't happen for a very long time. The initial meetings were all like this. They were interviews. It was this whole set of winnowing down questions. Who are you? Um, what are the qualities that define you? And, you know, again, intimacy, warmth, transparency, connection between people, human scale, but still thinking big and grand, you know, big ideas. Words that I have no idea how you're going to turn that into a building, because it's not what I do, but, but there you are. That went on for months of the process and made us nervous. At some point, are we going to be sketching out a building here? And because it happens over such that long period of time, the design just evolves at this pace. 
that allows you to really advance and really begin to see it. There was a crucial moment where they said because of budget for a theater like you guys, um, it's going to need to start off as a rectangle. It was a huge disappointment because I'm thinking, you know, sit in the opera house with these sort of amazing pillows of space. But then immediately he said, this is how we're going to deal with that. And he started to manipulate what a square was or what a, what a box was. We're going to have these three theaters coexisting as these perfect isolated sound boxes glued together by this beautiful, open, glassy, lively public space. But once you cross that threshold into those theaters, boom, you're in a different world. As soon as they started to show us what that would look like, uh, I completely forgot about the, you know, the sort of limitation that it needs to be built in blocks. There are so many cool places to explore in this theater. So I've been wandering around, trying to figure out what's what, get the lay of the land. Now they haven't given me access to anything, but I found my way back here to this backstage area. And I saw some of the setups that they're working on. And then I saw this giant metal wall. And I said to myself, what is this? Until I saw this little green button. And I figured if you see a green button, then you better push it. Whoa. Impressive. Well, we're going to leave those people alone to do their job and we'll move on. Let's see if we can find another door that's unlocked. Construction was absolute madness. Such organized, carefully regimented madness. When you're a theater company, you're used to building things that last for four weeks, not for a hundred years. So the scale of it and the number of people involved and the unpredictability of it was really amazing. This is something that everybody's going to see, not only in our community, but the region, the country. You know, it's going to be a lot of sleepless nights. Too much rock, contaminated soil. What are we going to do? How do we move forward without exhausting our contingency? The things you're doing you know, at foundation level, trying to make sure it's going to line up with what you're going to do on the last day, will keep you up at night. Everything within the space becomes part of the architecture. Every day was about putting in a finished product. Every piece of pipe you see was thought about. And the whole time, there was this complex coordination going on between the design team and the builders because there's no space in the world like a theater. If you look at the degrees of complexity of building types, it's hospitals and theaters. Those are the most complex buildings. It's because of the acoustic demands, all the cabling. Thousands of miles of wire. All the just the huge spaces and tiny spaces. Would it look better here, there? Can we eliminate it all together? Can we get it in the slab? The front of house, the back of house spaces, the security needs, the IT needs. People don't really realize that when they look at a theater building, and really they shouldn't. The fact that you walk into that space and you don't understand its complexity, you just enjoy the details. It's kind of an engineering miracle. These jobs require you to be on point all the time. There's never a relaxing moment. It never goes into an autopilot mode by any stretch. It's definitely a testament to the incredible precision and dedicated just commitment of those builders. 
guess you could say I'm a glutton for punishment, <laughs> you know. To be off a quarter inch at any point meant it wasn't going to line up. We weren't. This self-proclaimed glutton for punishment is Morris Vines, that, uh, project uh, superintendent for Baldwin and Shell, you know, and he, along with project manager Mario Beltram, so led the team responsible for the construction of Theater Squared. The team for this project was based on previous experience, previous projects that Baldwin and Shell has completed, and luckily Morris and I have completed similar projects of this complexity. You know, they called us the M&M &M team for that reason, because we have been working together for the past decade uh, on these high design projects. The theater at the Walton Arts Center was great, but it was time for Theater Square to expand. That meant a bigger theater with a lot of bigger, cooler technology but there were some specific things that they had concerns about. Hey, who's up there? First and foremost, let's talk about acoustics. Theater Squared had performances just across the street for several years. Less than a block from us, there is a uh, train track. And there is a train. Train. The train. I don't think you guys have heard this yet. Oh yes, we heard the train. Without fail, in the evening, in the middle of a show, and it, not just the, the blast of the horn, but the rumble of that train, that was really a, a hindrance. A theater is driven by one thing and one thing alone, which is what makes it such a difficult program. It's gotta be acoustically perfect. They took a max decibel reading and they figured out from that, through formula, what we would need to completely cut out that train. And I had some friends at the Walton Art Center who were like, you're never gonna, you'll never cut that train out. <laughs> it was like, uh, and I was worried myself, it is awfully loud. So you can't have anything violating that space because the minute something does violate that space, the magic of the theater disappears and all of a sudden you're back in the reality. With this facility literally just across the road, we did not want to hear that train. Did not want to hear that whistle blow. Each of those three spaces had to have perfect sound lock and perfect acoustics once you're inside that space so that the actor's voice can be delivered at a whisper and you can be sitting in the back of the audience in the back row and still hear what they're saying. They really have a robust system going on here. You're looking at, in some cases, 12 inches thick on the concrete walls, then faced with four inches of like a mineral wool type insulation. In front of that, there is a four to a six to an eight inch, depending on where you're at, CMU wall. And then in front of that, there may be a stud wall or some sort of stud furring in turn with more insulation and uh, finally the finished product in the wood which you see in the theater. We made those three theater boxes out of solid concrete because concrete is the best thing to isolate sound and we knew this from our experience in the previous theater project for St. Anne's Warehouse. Concrete was going to be our acoustical best friend. Concrete? That's cold! It's hard! It's ugly! It's everything that we are not! And our building is going to be made of that? If you just walked up to two concrete squares, you wouldn't necessarily feel like, I want to go into that space. It's for me. And Jonathan was very cool. He was like, yes, but we are going to find a way to do this that you are going to love. When most people think of concrete, they don't think of something that looks like this. We knew that we wanted to warm that up wherever we possibly could. Putting the impression of board onto the concrete was a huge step that made us feel like the space was going to be so much more friendly. But it took a lot of effort to transform something that is typically seen as cold and make it warm and inviting. You get one chance. 
one chance to get it right. You can't have honeycombing. There is no patching. You know, you're looking at watertight corners and making sure all your joints are extra tight. It's vibrated properly, yet not too much. It's just a uh, process. With only one shot to get it right, Morris had to make sure the texture of the boards was perfect before he could pour anything. Our, our first mock-up was just that. We used southern yellow pine, one by six, formed up some walls, lined it with the one by, cast it. You know, it imparted a, a finish and a texture to the wall, but wasn't quite there. Tried wire brushes, tried to remove some of the softer grains of the wood. That didn't quite do it. We actually took it a step further took the boards down and had them soda blasted. And that really did a great job of removing that, uh, that softer wood grain and really made you know, the harder grain pop and gives it that great dimensional look that it has now. Exceptionally important that people walk into our theater and immediately have a sense of who we are. And I think, oddly enough, the way that forming has worked does that. you can see that this board-formed concrete wall is a theater because every board-formed concrete wall is a theater. And you see that this is a public space because it has this kind of finish. The logic of all of these things is meant for humans. It's not some sort of abstract, you can only understand it if you've understood a poem that the architect read while designing the building. It is very much designed for you to read it like an open book or understand it like a well-made play. As theater makers, we pride ourselves on our ingenuity, like our ability to create magic and to create out of nothing um, something. And so I think when we were looking at the site, we wanted to take those principles with us and be as economical and uh, sustainable as possible when we were building the building. They wanted to repurpose the one of the six boards that we used to uh, form these concrete walls with. We actually saved enough of a quantity to clad the rehearsal uh, space up on third floor, as well as the spring theater here on, on ground level. Uh, then we also ar sourced Arkansas steel, Arkansas-based concrete. We even, uh, when we cut down the trees from the site, saved them, dry kilned them, and then made them into the furniture um, throughout the building and throughout the cafe space uh, in the commons. It's been really a point of pride for us that we sort of were able to do as much as we could, as sustainably as we could, and as affordably as we could um, to make a project of this scale uh, into reality. When we start to focus on materials, it becomes this tremendous investigation into what makes a good building on the outside, but also what makes it a beautiful experience on the inside. We wanted people to reach out and touch the materials as they passed through the building. So we wanted raw materials that by themselves looked great and looked better as they weathered over time and also looked lived in as people interacted with them. We wanted to have materials that really felt like they were of the place and that had a connection to Arkansas and to Fayetteville itself. And we wanted to represent wood at every stage of its life. The raw wood backstage, which is exactly where raw wood should be. The finished wood in the commons, which are the spaces where you want to feel elevated as you walk in and the charred wood, that's the cladding of these other spaces, which is really showing, look how much process means to us. The design of this theater is focused on tangibility, a physical connection to the actual space. And that's evident in the choice of this charred wood cladding. And what they've done is they've taken a sustainably modified wood and charred the outside of it using a process called shausugiban and that not only has created this amazing texture, but also makes it resistant to the elements. 
we caught up with the makers of Shasugiban for this project to learn a little bit more about the process. Who are these guys from Texas? Why are they burning wood? Are they crazy? Uh, what's going on here? Located in Austin, Texas, Delta Millworks is known for being a pioneer in the charred wood trend in the U.S. Now they've developed a sophisticated and proprietary process for finishing wood, but the Shosugiban technique was originally discovered by accident. We got into Shosugiban because of the building we're in. It was built in 1947 and it had a leaky roof. Our current owner, Robbie Davis, was playing around with a roofing torch and a dug fur beam and realized the Japanese had been doing it for hundreds of years. And they realized that wood that had already had a char on the surface was harder to reignite. It protects the wood from rot, decay, movement, insects, and a host of other things. Theater Squared is something that I started working on with Marvel Architects in New York. We were in their office doing a sales trip and they brought it to the table. It was immediately exciting. The discovery that that was possible as a material was amazing. We didn't want metal. We wanted wood for everything that wood can do, but how can you deal with that? They needed a high-grade, long-term solution for the siding something that had a good flame spread rating. We used a full gator finish for Theater Squared. It's our most traditional Shishugi bond, and it, it lasts the longest. It's the lowest maintenance. It's gonna weather like any other piece of wood that's outside, like any other finish, but if everybody's okay with the way it weathers, there's really no reason to go back and touch it. Combined with a modified wood, it's a 30 to 40 year product. So then when we discovered that this charring process makes the, the wood last so long, that was golden. Theater Squared had the rare opportunity to design a building that catered to them and their audience. Beyond acoustics and materials, the team had to decide how to configure the stage and seating without losing what the community loved most about their old space. One of the things that is really, I think, unique about T2's uh, West Theater is that the stage area, the playing area, is massive. Uh, it is about the size of the Royal Opera House in London, which is designed to seat thousands of people, and our theater seats 300. So when I talk about something that is, feels epic and immersive, I mean, there isn't a bad seat in the house. Um, if you were to go to the Royal Opera House in London and get the best seats in the house, the house seats that are reserved for VIPs only, you would be sitting in the last row of our theater. So we had this challenge, how to keep the intimacy and that closeness and proximity to the audience and add 100 seats and maybe more. That's one of the reasons we needed a new space. One of the very first conversations we had with Andy Hales, who's the principal of Charcoal Blue, he said, you know, we have learned that when you get this kind of opportunity to build your own theater from the ground up, don't reinvent yourself don't reinvent the configuration, the space. These guys are brilliant, Charcoal Blue. Um, figure out a way to basically overlay, if you put down a, a map of our old space on top of what we have right now, this new space is only really a row or two deeper. And even in spite of it being a couple rows deeper, that last row is only another like three, four feet further from the stage than we were when we were across the street. Charcoal Blue also included an additional one to two rows of seating on the second floor that is referred to as the circle level. This created additional seating without the audience feeling disconnected from the performance. Something you know. I'm going to play. Hey, hey, help me, kids. Uh, 
Shall I compare thee? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thy lips? Mm, too far. <laughs> This building really represents the magic of live theater, the magic of human connectivity, the magic of being able to collaborate with fellow artists. Many people put a lot into this, poured their heart and soul into it. Three, two, one. A lot of lost sleep, but I guarantee your woman's proud of it. Watching people kind of filter in and come into this space, which is so inviting. People would come, will come in and they're like, so what, what is this place? And I'm like, it, I'm glad you asked, it's a theater. Sure, we would love to be and recognized as a nationally significant theater. And that's why it's wonderful to see these awards uh, coming in for the building and seeing critical recognition coming in from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. But at the end of the day, what will feel like success is if people are just streaming in, not a single one of them pauses and goes, am I in the right place? Is this for me? But rather, every single person knows it's their home too. Wrapping up at Theater Squared in Fayetteville, Arkansas, I'm Ben Roberts for Design versus Build. There he is, let's get him. <laughs>